Good morning, or uh, depending on where you, or when you're looking at this, good afternoon or good evening. Well, this is different, isn't it? Um, social distancing. Somebody said to me last week, uh, this is a dream come true for introverts. Um, and I guess it is in some respects. Uh, we are still, of course, going to have fellowship. We're going to have interaction. It uh, may not be physically, but it will be electronically. One difference, of course, is that I can't see you. Uh, so I can't see if you're sleeping or not. But don't worry, I know who the sleepers are. Uh, another difference is that there's nothing on the screen. Um, and that's kind of unfortunate because I have this absolutely brilliant video that I wanted to show you today. Uh, it's a, it's a life-changing video that I would have put up on the screen, um, and you're really, really missing something by not being able to see that. Uh, no, I'm joking. I don't have a video. But, um, of course, there will be no Bible passages on the screen, so please have your Bibles handy. Um, the readings will be from the NIV, uh, so you can follow along there. And uh, you have got an outline that we sent you earlier, so please use that to take notes. We're beginning in a new series today on the first letter of the Apostle John. And this is going to be an introduction today. We're going to be all over the place, all over the book, uh, kind of do an overview as introduction this morning. And uh, I hope this morning that you will watch this with your family, that you will pray together, uh, that you will partake of the Lord's Supper together in your home. We're in the midst of a pandemic. And it's scary. It's scary because experts say most of us will contract this disease, this virus. And to some, it will be fatal, which is why we're taking such extreme measures. But I guess it's time for some to consider their mortality. Now, it's very rare that you will know when you are going to pass from life to death. It's very rare for anybody to know that. But it should not be rare for us as Christians to know that we have passed from death to life. And John wrote this letter, he wrote this epistle so that we would not be in the dark about that truth. We live in a society in which ambiguity rules. We are not supposed to be certain. We are not supposed to be dogmatic uh, or absolute about anything. You know, everything in today's world has more than one perspective or more than one truth. Uh, everyone must have their own truth about uh, every issue that suits them, that speaks to them. Now, that's the way our society works, but John did not get that memo. He doesn't think that way. In five chapters, he says, we know 36 times. 36 times he says, we know, we know. Not we think, not we suppose, not we hope, but we know. And that is important because he's writing to a church, he's writing to people whose knowledge were being attacked, whose spiritual knowledge was being attacked. They were doubting. They were wondering to themselves, you know, these people are saying this, do we really know? He is writing this letter to them in black and white, he's writing to a church who's struggling with gray, who's struggling with doubt. And so last week I asked you about, uh, you know, a pop quiz, remember, about uh, which words do John use more than any other words or any other uh, writer in the, in the Bible? And uh, we saw, of course, he uses love more than anybody else. Uh, he uses truth more than anybody else. He uses life more than anybody else. And of course, he uses the word light in his writings more than any other author. And in this epistle, John sheds some light for us. He sheds some light on truth that we can know, that we can be sure of. And so he's writing to a church that's basically under attack, and uh, under attack by Satan. And the church has always been under attack by Satan. But this church is being unsettled by teachers of a false doctrine. And John calls them deceivers. He calls them false prophets. He even calls them antichrists. They are leading the people astray. Look at uh, chapter 2, 26. I am writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. Now these people are not outsiders. They are supposed 
Christians. These are people who, as Paul says of Satan to the Corinthians, are masquerading as angels of light. They masquerade. In other words, they're pretending. These are not genuine Christians. They're pretending. In chapter 2, verse 19, he says, They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. In other words, you had these people who, who present themselves as Christians and they're saying, well, this knowledge that we've received from the apostle, these, these truths that we've gotten from God, well, it's no longer good enough for us. And they claim to be enlightened. They claim to know new things, to have a new, better knowledge. And so they're trying to lead the church away to their progressive, their progressive way of thinking. And so the Christians in the church, they were thinking, they were doubting, do I really know what I need to know? Am I really a Christian? I mean, listen to what these people are saying. They sound so progressive. They sound so sophisticated. Am I really a Christian? And John is saying to them, those people, they are the ones who are not Christians. They are pretenders. You remember in the gospel, he wrote, I write these things, I write this gospel to you, that you may believe in Jesus Christ. In other words, he wrote the gospel to arouse faith. He wrote this letter to assure faith. And so he shed some light on truth that we can be certain of. Three things that a Christian can be sure of, that a Christian can take a stand upon. First, the first thing is you can be sure, Christian, you can be sure of the identity of your Savior. Now I know that statement is insulting to many people in our society, to most people perhaps in our society. You know, it's insulting for us to be dogmatic about anything, to be so sure of anything. It's, it's, it's an insult to be dogmatic about anything, uh, especially religion, especially when you say to people, hey, you have sin and you need a savior. You're hopeless and you need a savior. And even more than that, you say, this is who he is. You need a savior and this is who the one and only Savior is. We need to know that Christianity, as some people in the world think, Christianity is not just a bunch of good ideas. It's not just a, Jesus was not just a good teacher. He wasn't just a prophet. He wasn't uh, presenting just one way amongst many ways. This way is one way that can help you live life a little bit better. Christianity is about God reaching down, acting in history through Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And Christian, you cannot be fuzzy about Jesus. You cannot be fuzzy about who Jesus is and be a Christian. John says in his Gospel, chapter 5 and verse 5, Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Only he who believes that Jesus is God in the flesh. God in the flesh. Now back then, that was incredibly revolutionary. It's still revolutionary today, of course, but then especially so because they had this prevailing philosophy. They believed that matter was evil. Uh, and that was a philosophy that dominated the, the, the ancient world. Matter is evil, your flesh is evil. And so God could not possibly come down and be in the flesh. He couldn't come as flesh. And so what some might teach is, well, perhaps the spirit... You know, Jesus was born in the flesh, he was born a man, but perhaps the Spirit entered Jesus when he was baptized. Spirit came down, and then he lived his life, and then just before the cross, the Spirit left him again. But you cannot have God in the flesh. You cannot have Jesus as God. And so they're casting doubt on Jesus as Savior. Uh, listen to what he says in 1 John 4 from verse 1. Many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. How can you know who Jesus is? How can you be sure of his identity? How can you be sure he is the Son of God? He is God come in the flesh and that he is your Savior. Well, the way you can know it is God made it very clear. 
He made it very clear because he wants us to know this. And he made it clear in two primary ways. First of all, there's the witness of the Holy Spirit. The witness of the Holy Spirit. He uses a beautiful word in chapter 2. He uses the word anointing. He speaks of the anointing. You've been anointed with the Holy Spirit so that you can know whether this teaching about Jesus is true or false. 1 John 2.20 But you have an anointing from the Holy One and all of you know the truth. So the first way we can know for sure is the witness of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, is the witness of the apostles. In other words, their testimony about Jesus. What they saw and what they heard, they wrote down. Look at the very first verse in the, in the, in the letter. That which was from the beginning, this is now Jesus, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. In other words, when it comes to Jesus, it's not just rumors, it's not just stories that have been collected, it's not second-hand encounters or second-hand uh, witness accounts. Uh, John says to us, John says to his church, we were there, we were there, we saw him, we heard him, we spoke to him, we touched him, he spoke to us, we saw it all, we interacted physically with him. We are sure, so you can be sure. You see, one day, at the judgment seat of God, nobody's going to be able to stand before God and say, if Jesus were your son, why didn't you say so? Why didn't you give us a clue? All right. Well, he did. Of course he did. He made sure that we can be sure. God, God has made certain that we can know, know for sure. Chapter 5 and verse 9. And I, and I emphasize God has made certain. This is God's testimony. We accept man's testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God, which he has given about his son. Anyone who believes in the son of God has this testimony in his heart. Anyone who does not believe has made him out to be a liar because he has not believed the testimony God has given about his son. So God has made sure that we do not have to be in the dark about who Jesus is. You can be sure of the identity of your Savior. Secondly, you can be sure of the certainty of your conversion. See, you need to know, you need to know, not hope, that you have been born again. That you've been converted from one belief system to another, from a false belief system to a true belief system. It's interesting that word conversion doesn't really appear in uh, at the Bible or in the New Testament. Uh, the, when people converted to Judaism, they were called proselytes, and they, it means to convert from one people to another people. Uh, the one place in the New Testament that it could mean conversion, it's a Greek word which means to turn around. In other words, you, you, you're in this group of people, but you turn around and you come to this group of people, they have a false belief system, and this one has a true belief system, and you come here. In other words, you convert from that to this. And John is saying to us, you can be certain, you can be certain of your conversion. And he gives us three tests, three tests in the letter. You can test your conversion. If you want to know if you're going to be converted, you can test it. Now, he gives three tests, but he doesn't give the first one in chapter 1 and then the second in chapter 2 and so on. Uh, it's kind of a, in a spiral way he gives it to us. He gives us one, two, three, and then two and three and one. And all through the book, he gives us these tests. Um, now, we already have the first one. Okay, the first test is the doctrinal test. Doctrinal test, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Now, again, I said you cannot be fuzzy about this, okay? But pretenders will come and they'll try and blur this. They'll try and cloud this truth, you know, make it uncertain. You know, do we really have to believe that? Do we have to be so certain about that? But a true Christian will never reduce or replace Jesus. In other words, they'll never make him less than who he is or replace him with anything else or even add something to him to make him a little bit more acceptable to the world. He is the one and he is the only one. 1 John 4, 13 through 15. We know, he says, there's that we know that we see 36 times in the letter. We know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. 
There's the witness of the Spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, if anyone acknowledges this, this is the doctrinal test, that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in Him, and He lives in God. So do you believe? That's the first test. We're saved by grace through faith. And then secondly is the moral test. The moral test is, are you walking in the light? John says, how we behave, how we walk, how we live, indicates if we really believe or not. And this is James. James says that, you know, uh, faith without works is dead. If you, if you say you believe, then some works must follow. There must be some uh, results. There must, some, there must be something to show your faith. Uh, and we're saved by faith, or saved through faith, uh, and that faith then produces a holy lifestyle. We need to understand, you know, we, we hear so, so many sermons and so many sermons and so many sermons. Uh, Christianity is not about information. It's not about information. You can know all the facts. You can know all the doctrines. You can be dogmatic about the dogma, but still be a pretender. Because Christianity is not about information. It's about transformation. And you've probably seen that bumper sticker that says, Christians are not perfect, just forgiven. Or maybe you've seen it on Facebook in the modern world. Christians are not perfect, just forgiven. Well, that's not quite there. It's not quite right. We're not just forgiven. We're made new. We're changed. We're different. We're not perfect, but we are being transformed. And that's why the New Testament calls the spiritual life, this living spirit, he calls it a walk. He says, when you walk, uh, you need to walk this way. You need to uh, walk in this. Uh, in other words, it's a journey. That's why the New Testament talks about it as a walk. It's a journey of growth. And we grow in this belief, this new belief, this new faith, this new trust system that we have converted into. Uh, Jesus, His Holy Spirit, sheds His light on our path, sheds His light on our lives, and we now walk in His light, we walk in His truth, and we, which means we obey Him. We obey Him. Uh, 1 John 2, from verse 3, We know that we have come to know Him if we obey His commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him, whoever claims to live in him, must walk as Jesus did. In 1 John 3, 6, he says, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Now listen to that passage. I want to make something clear, and we're going to deal with this uh, more in the coming weeks. John is not saying a real Christian never sins. He's not saying a real Christian will never sin. In fact, he says just the opposite. He says, if you don't sin, you're a liar. Uh, but he says, yeah, don't keep on sinning. If we live in Him, if we know Him, we don't continue to keep on sinning. We are forgiven and we're given life by His grace. And then we grow in that grace. We grow in that new life. We progress in our walk. And as we walk and as we're tempted by Satan, as he attacks us to go astray, the Holy Spirit convicts us. And the Holy Spirit brings out into the light any sin or any disobedience in our walk. And a Christian, a true Christian, will never ignore the conviction of the Holy Spirit. There's something that I found to be true. I found this to be true. As you grow in Christ, you will find sin to be increasingly distasteful. Distasteful. And you'll find obedience to be delightful. And you'll find confidence in the obvious change in your life. And even when you do sin, as you walk in the light, even when you do sin, you will grow in the remorse that you feel. Something that, which before you could do without any displeasure. In fact, in your former life, you did it with great pleasure, and then you became a Christian. And you will grow as a Christian. You will be increasingly be filled with disgust at that kind of behavior. And so your remorse will grow uh, in whatever sin you may do now and then. And that's from this divine testimony in your heart. First John 3, 
9. No one who is born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning, because he has been born of God. He cannot go on sinning, because he has been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are, and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. And that brings us to the third test, the social test. Do you love your brothers and sisters? And for John, I think love is the single greatest proof of inner change. You, do you want to know if there's transformation happening in your life? Well, then look for a deepening, growing love for people who you in your flesh would not want to love. You'd find them very difficult to love in your flesh, but you love them more and more and more. 1 John 3.14, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. We know we've passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. See, people who don't really love the church, who don't really love their brothers and sisters, they're pretenders. They're pretenders. They're still dead in their sins. They don't have any new birth or new life. 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. And he's so absolute, so certain about this. 1 John 4, 12. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. See, Satan wants to make you doubt. He wants you to doubt that you've been born again. And so he's going to try and unsettle you. He's even going to try and torment you with his whispers. But God does not want you to doubt. God wants you to be sure. He wants you to know. And so thirdly, you can be sure of the identity of your Savior. You can be sure of the certainty of your conversion. And thirdly, you can be sure of the security of your salvation of your salvation. Perhaps you're thinking to yourself as you're looking at this test, you know, boy, I don't always pass these tests. I don't pass them. I don't always walk in the light. I don't always love my brother. And you might start doubting, especially when Satan comes and he whispers in your ear, you're not good enough. You're really not good enough. And what you do at those times, when Satan whispers that to you, or when you start doubting yourself because of this test, and you think, well, I don't measure up to this test, you turn to 1 John 5.13. This is your verse, 1 John 5, 13. John says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. You may know that you have eternal life. Let me give you a question or two. When Jesus died on the cross, did he die for your sins? Did he die on the cross for your sins? And of course, of course he did. He shed his blood on the cross to wash away all your sin. He died on the cross to wash away all your sin. His blood flowed to wash away all your sin. And then this question, when he died on the cross, when he died on the cross, how many of your sins were still in the future? How many of them were still in the future? Every one of them. Every one of them. You see, you need to understand that God knows who you are. God knows who you are. God knows your best. Your best is not enough. He knows you need a Savior. Someone who speaks for you. Someone who comes in between for you. Someone who acts for you. Someone who advocates for you. 1 John 2, verses 1 and 2. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice. He is the sacrifice that takes away all our sins. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. 1 John 2 and verse 12, I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven not on account of your ability, on account of His name. And so the question is not, how much have you sinned? 
The question is, how much have you trusted in God's answer, God's provision, God's sacrifice for your sin? You can be sure of the security of your salvation. You can be sure of your salvation. Because it's secure. It is secure. Harry Ironside, a famous preacher, said the following. He said, some have a very uncertain view of salvation. They say salvation is like Noah offering to put a peg on the outside of the ark. In other words, he says, I'm going to nail a peg into the ark, and if you, sinner, if you just hang on through the storm and through the rain and through the wind, if you hang on, you'll be saved. Salvation is not dependent on our holding on to God, but on our being securely held by and in Christ. And so the devil, Satan, does not want you to know who Jesus is. He doesn't want you to be sure of your salvation. He doesn't want you to be secure in your salvation. He doesn't want you to be convinced of your conversion. He wants you to be in the dark, wondering, doubting about all those things. But John sheds light. Look at how, the, how he ends the book. 1 John 5, 19. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We know they don't. They're under the control of the evil one. We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. You're in His Son. You're not outside holding on to a peg. You're in His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. The church has always been plagued by bogus Christianity, by pretenders, by false teachers. Don't let that disturb or unsettle your own walk with God, because here is a truth that you can cling to. It always comes to light who is really in the sun. Who is really in the sun, that's always going to come to light. In the end, real and bogus Christians will be revealed. They'll be separated. The wheat and the tares, they're going to be separated. So you don't have to doubt who you are. You don't have to doubt because you know who your Savior is. We know because God wants us to know. Now, we may not be able to figure it all out. You may not have all the answers, but you can know that Jesus is your Savior, and in Him, salvation is secure. Why don't you pray with me? Father, thank You for being a God who sheds light, who gives truth, who imparts knowledge, who makes sure that we don't have to stumble around in the dark. We can know for sure. You've, you've given us light, Father. And we're able to walk in that light. And we're able to walk by the security of the Holy Spirit and the testimony of the, of the apostles. Thank you, Father, for that. We praise your awesome name. I want to encourage you now to spend some time with your family in prayer. Partake of the Lord's Supper. Uh, from next week, I hope we'll have some songs with the band. Um, recorded as well that they can uh, that you can uh, listen to or sing along to thank you for listening uh, thank you for watching have a great week god bless